Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Polyhedron Cladocast episode 72. I'm Steve Tudor. I'm John Cage. I'm Andy Lewis. And I'm Rory Summers. Well, we have a full compliment again. It seems like it's been absolute ages since we had all of us. It's been a little it while, has been... hasn't it? Yeah. We are mm. back. Mm. Yes. Of course. Full powered. If we were an American podcast, this would be the Halloween special. But we're not American, we're British, and we really don't give a f*** about Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> well, you say that, we're having a party in Beaudley. I mean, not like the entire town, obviously, that would be a bit mad, but uh, the board gaming crew here is uh, is having a Halloween special, and we're doing a murder mystery. Ooh. And I'm going as, you know, the kind of witch doctor voodoo chap from Live and Let Die? Someone like that. So I've got to find a costume. Beautiful day. Exactly. Or I go as Manny Calavera. <laughs> I don't remember any of these things. No. There's something wrong with my brain. Do you know, you must have played, um, oh, what's it called? Um, Is that from Grim Fandango? Grim Fandango, that's the one, yes. Manny no, Calavera. Never played it. No, have never played that. Oh, it's point and click. Um, I was going to say Ron Jeremy then, but it's not Ron Jeremy. It's, um, <laughs> what's his name? That's a completely different kind of pointing and clicking, that is. <laughs> yeah, no, that's very, very different. <laughs> I was going to say Ron Perlman. No, it's not Ron Perlman either. The guy who did Monkey Island. Okay. You just... Rod Gilbert. That's him. <laughs> not Rod Gilbert, Jesus. <laughs> not a Welsh comedian either. That's the Welsh wow. comedian. <laughs> Good grief. Right. Let's just let's just assume that you guys are, are all old and you've forgotten names and move on. If you've tuned in for this to this podcast for an informative podcast about board games and other tabletop games, obviously those previous three minutes have proven that you're in completely the wrong place. <laughs> or that you need to be very patient. Ron Gilbert! <laughs> There will be some board game banter in here somewhere. It just might take us a while to warm things up and get to it. In about half an hour. We've had ten minutes of nonsense preamble. Well, you know, we've got Pre-preamble. to get it out. We've not been together for a while. It turns out that's not enough to get it out of our systems. No. There is a Halloween special. It will be in Beaudley, and we're doing a murder mystery, and I am going as a voodoo Someone. chap. Yes. Didn't you do a murder mystery this last weekend, though? I was a murder mystery this weekend, and it was very good. That was also one well, not in Beaudley. It left from Kidderminster. It went through Beaudley all the way to Bridge North on the Seven Valley Railway. That's very uh, nice. The, oh, yes, it was lovely. I had dinner and a show on the train. So you go along, you sit down, you dress up in sort of 30s gear. So I went as a mill owner with a pipe, obviously. <laughs> Any excuse. Any excuse. Uh, I wasn't allowed to smoke it, though, so it wasn't loaded. It was just there as a prop. Um, <laughs> Disappointed you didn't fill it with bubbles or something like that. that See, we did cool. consider that, but we couldn't find it to put in the end. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, you get, get on the train. Everyone else is in sort of costume as well. And there is some very cheesy acting um, along the train where, you know, grand, grandmother who's an author and is escorted by granddaughter. Uh, and then there's a, a, a doctor who is going home to see his, his wife, but he spends too much time away. So he's basically looking to pump anything that moves. And then there's a, a, a twisted politician whose you know, wife just basically hates him because he's always drunk. You know, those sorts of things. And then there's all of this acting, and then you get to Bridge North Station, they all get off, and then the murder happens, and there's the ah! moment. And then you all get back on, you've got to basically work out who did it. Uh, it was very, very fun. Really, really good. So we did it actually for my mum's 65th birthday, belated. And she rather enjoyed it. But uh, it was a damn good night, and I got properly stuck in. So I was mixing with the actors mm. and actresses, ended up playing. It was perfect role play. It really was. So I ended up going from um, a mill owner, and I also owned a publishing business because the grandmother on the train wanted to publish her books. So I was posing as a, as a publisher. And uh, my party was, uh, they were all actually formally written as guests of Dr. Andy Lewis. But that's me, and I'm the one who did the booking. So I just played into that as well. And the inspector on the train is like, ah, the good doctor, you must be able to help. <laughs> As he sidles up next to me. It was brilliant. It was the best bit of live action role playing I've ever been in. Sounds interesting, yeah. They've even tried to recruit me. <laughs> oh, heavens above. I know. I might actually take them up on it, but we shall see. Interesting. It was good fun, really good. It's like panto on a train, basically. It was really good fun. I can thoroughly recommend it. I like the sound of it. I like the idea of murder mystery on a train. That does mm. sound very cool. But well, there's three coaches they do. 
everyone has dinner. There's a lot of dinner. But the actors, and they act out the scene at each end of each carriage. So they have to, have to act out the scene six times at each time they do it. That must get wearing. Do you think they get better towards the end? Like carriage six, they're like pros. Or maybe they're bored by that point. <laughs> oh, he's dead. Never mind. Move on. But yes, it was great fun. Really enjoyed it. Did you it. manage to solve the mystery, though? Mm. Uh, no. Oh. It was solved, just not by me. Ah. Ah, the thing is, Dr. we did Lewis. we did find. Well, I think I still maintain I went for the one with the strongest motive, but there were kind of four possible solutions really, and uh, we did learn that during the uh, during the evening that they kind of mix it up a bit. So obviously, not every journey is the same. So there's going to be a different murderer and different victim each time. So I think there's a little bit of pot luck in it because okay. our um, our solution was perfectly. Steve and I went and played golf. What? But not regular golf. You don't we look like golfers. No. <laughs> no. Do you even know which end of the bat you have to hold? Club. I've told you before, it's a stick. Uh, and the big end. Yeah, the, the one with the, <laughs> with the black grippy handly thing. That's the end that you're supposed to hold. Okay. No, we, we didn't go and do 18 holes of golf on a proper golf course. We went to Ghetto Golf in Birmingham. It's very good. It is good. It is a lot of fun. It's very bizarre as well. It is. There are some interesting obstacles in that place. Yes. Like, in some places you're playing through a bus. In some places you're playing through basically like a lounge, someone's living room. In other places you're avoiding uh, some massive rubbery dildos. What? <laughs> awesome. Was one of them sparkly? No sparkly ones. But one of them was a fist. <laughs> Was this in the Netherlands? Birmingham, Amsterdam? <laughs> Could have no, been. this was in Birmingham. It was very bizarre. I mean, there was like a blockbuster store was one of the holes. A pub was another hole. Tempin Bowling Alley was another one, which I did particularly crap at. There was some um, some games-themed ones, so it's like Sonic Hedgehog and uh, Dr. Robotnik. Oh, very cool. Yeah, it was good fun. Is mm. it still 18 holes? 18-themed holes, is it? Yeah, it was. No. That's all right. Good times, yeah. boy. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So it was like, was it 10 quid or something like that? But about an hour or so. It's it was good. something like 10 quid, which I thought was actually ridiculously cheap considering what it was. Um, and what was even better was there was a bar there and there was beer service as you were walking around. Mm -hmm. So you could uh, put a beer order in, in between holes and uh, they brought it to the course for you. Yeah, I played one in London or Alex's or, you know, the manager of the nags in Melbourne. Mm. We are on his stag do in London. We play ghetto golf down there. Same idea. You know, you get in, oh, it's only 10 quid, but then you discover it's five quid for a can of can of beer. Ah, this is how they make their money. <laughs> Although that was probably London prices. Mm. Still got through six cans. It's fine. Nice. So yeah, that was um, a good uh, birthday celebration. So that's not the only thing we've been up to. I also dropped into the dice box the other day on my travels. Mm. Is that in Leamington? In Leamington, yeah. I saw the good folks there. They Except gave me, me a good introduction about uh, what board games are like these days <laughs> and how the, the cafe's doing well. So is this the board game cafe, not yep. the board game shop? The board game cafe, yeah. Right. Is this the board game shop and cafe that's round the corner from a member of this podcasting team? Yes. Yeah, yeah it is. Did you go, Rory? No. Didn't, oh. didn't know what was happening. That's nice. Just, just... John drove all the way down to Leamington, went to my local game shop with a coffee, cake, played some games. Ah, uh, well, let me stop you there. What a wanker. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, w I went down to Leamington to visit my buddy Gav, who I haven't seen for ages. He now lives down there. And while we were there, he said, oh, by the way, there's this board game cafe. We should go and have a look. And I was like, oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, why not? Let's go and have a look. So what popped in and they started giving us the spiel about, you know, there's all these modern board games now and we're trying to, you know, raise awareness <laughs> of all the board games and stuff. And I was like, about halfway through, I was like, he's like, so do you guys play many board games? I'm like, yeah, I play quite a few board games. <laughs> uh, I, I do like a board gaming podcast. And they're like, oh, right, cool. Which one? I'm like uh, the Polyhedron Collider. Oh, we listen to you guys. You guys must know uh, Rory then. <laughs> and then he's like, hey, these two guys from the Polyhedron Collider. <laughs> and Gav's like, uh, no, no, I'm nothing to do with this. 
<laughs> and then there's a says. pause, and he's like, in fact, didn't we meet you at uh, the UK Games Expo? Didn't we have quite a long chat? And then there's an awkward pause, and I'm like, hmm, now that you said that, you do look sort of familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, John's gone full celebrity. Who are you people? Do you know who I am? <laughs> yes, they do, after a bit of nudging. And then I know who they are. <laughs> Excellent. Oops. John, memory like a goldfish cage, at it again. <laughs> and was claiming he plays board games. That's the biggest lie of the afternoon. <laughs> How dare you. I have played some board games this time. In we fact, you've played more games on our docket this week than usual. There you go. Yeah, it's we true. Have. I think... Basically, I've been helped because I've got a new little board game group at work I've set up and uh, slowly recruited at least two people so far to play board games with me on my lunch. When you say recruited, do you mean like chained up in the basement kind of thing or (laughs) feed them twice a day? Yeah, that's (laughs) exactly what. (laughs) And today we will play. Yes, today it was trip lock, but the less said about that, the better. (laughs) <laughs> no, we have to. You have to talk about that now. Is Triplock shit? Oh, yeah, you said Triplock shit before, haven't you? I have, uh, but I'm not going to repeat myself or let right, you do I it. I think so. you said it was beyond shit. So bad. <laughs> well, speaking of new stuff, I have finally a new table, which is nice. D, it was not easy to get in. No, it was not. No, John was actually, he came around on Friday night, and the table was supposed to be delivered between 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. 9 p.m. So John, had a, John and I had a very good excuse to leave work early so I can get here, to be prepared and ready to bring it through the house. And it didn't turn up till half past 11 at night. Oh, <laughs> By the time we'd had four beers and half a <laughs> bottle of wine each. <laughs> I hadn't quite started on the whiskey at that point, but it wasn't far off. No. So let's just get the house in, okay? The table can go over there. Chair. So how much of your hallway has had to be repainted? None, actually, but we did have to take the door off. <laughs> at half past 11 at night. Not the front door, thankfully, just, just the hallway door. Considering the manoeuvring that went on, I think your house came off remarkably unscathed from that experience. <laughs> that's, that's because we're professionals, John. That's what it is. <laughs> we I communicated think we were lucky. well. Rotate it, in you go. We actually had to send the guy who drove the van home because he got in. It was half eleven at night, and he looked absolutely exhausted. He was two and a half hours late, and we just said, "You know what? It's in the house, mate. Just go. Home. We'll sort it from here." Are you sure? It'll be fine. <laughs> Laura looked less sure that that was going to be the case, but uh, we sent him on his way anyway. Yes, so it's in, it's br- it's massive, um, but one of the things I do find about a lot of tables these days is they're not wide enough. So for sort of a lot of board games where you've got a player board and a board in the middle and everyone sort of sat mm. around it, you do frequently mm. run out of space. So we got this one extra wide for board gaming. Mm, and it good works thinking. Very good, exactly. So uh, custom built in Scotland. I reckon nice. you could get all of Talisman and all of its expansions on that table. That's how big it is. Mahoosive. Mm. Yes. So I've no I would for. say challenge accepted, but I don't. No, neither do I. If Talisman enters my house, it would be burned in fire. <laughs> <laughs> Tempting to try and sneak a copy in there now. <laughs> do you know what? I reckon Alora might actually help you with that. <laughs> Not that she likes it, just to annoy me. <laughs> it's a worthy goal. <laughs> exactly. But your housemate like that, isn't she, Andy? She is, <laughs> yes, my housemate, yes, yes. <laughs> Thankfully, she saw the funny side of that when she listened to the podcast <laughs> after calling me a variety of words. Bullet dodge there, I think, mate. Yeah. So, Mr. News Ferrets, is there anything new and exciting that Andy could be playing on this table? Not really. <laughs> That's a bit of disappointment, isn't it? No. Wow. As, uh, as we release this episode, the world's biggest board game convention is happening and nothing exciting is happening, is what you're saying. Covered all of that Wait. last time, didn't we, Steve? So True, we did. Very professionally. Yeah. If Andy wants to know what he can go buy, what board games he can buy to go play on his new table, listen to episode 71, hosted by the most handsome and most ginger members of uh, Polyhedron Collider. 50% of that was right. <laughs> but not the best. <laughs> the B I'll crew, say. basically. John and I were on, you know, more important missions, and we left the uh, the office juniors to handle it. I was on my deathbed. <laughs> were you now? 
Did you have a cold? Oh, like shit. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Yorkshire on a boat. So, uh, that sounds hmm. much better. Well, I think we'll gloss over that. <laughs> You're not a fan of the whole uh, canal boating, are you? Well, let's just say that the best bits were in the evening when we'd stopped. Fair enough. <laughs> Mostly because we were in the pub. You know, can't you drink on them when they're going? Oh, I did, yeah. I got the whiskey out at 4pm on the first day. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, let's just say it's not my thing and move on from there. In the news this week, one of the things I found quite interesting was the announcement that almost Sir Ian Livingstone as has part of his capital capital investment group, Hero Capital, they've created a fund of a hundred million euros to support the game industry across England and Europe. Do you think they're aware of our efforts to uh, publicise board games and how much investment the Polyhedron Collider require? I was going to say, are you suggesting we should get a hundred million quid, John? <laughs> Not all of it. Oh, but you know. 90% I mean, how much it? How much would be reasonable? A couple of million? <laughs> I don't They've give out a bed for less than 10. What, 10 pounds? 10 yeah, pence? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 10 quid. Is this brand new announcement or is this uh, further details of something that was announced earlier? I believe because... this is a brand new announcement. So this is different to the um, investment that Ian Livingston's group gave to, gave to Steamforge Games earlier in the year. Yes, it is very different. This one is a more generic one, there to help games developers, publishers, designers across board games, games, esports, digital games, for them after they've had their initial injection of funding, for them to carry on their projects to kind of to help reinvigorate the sector. It's one of the biggest sectors in British business or European business at the moment, estimated at a colossal amount of numbers, which I haven't written down really? is this okay. games in general then is it this cover tabletop and video games i assume it does yes and esports as well mm-hmm. which i'm not entirely sure what esports are because it's not like playing computer games professionally i can tell you exactly what this is this is competitive video game playing right oh. so this is playing something like uh overwatch is a popular one star craft things like that in a, a competitive environment which is usually which has been televised. I think it made a massive headline earlier this year because the person who won the over the team who won the Overwatch tournament, which I think was a London based team, mm-hmm. got a ridiculous prize fund. It was something like oh, several hundred thousand pounds each. It may have even wow. been more. Wow. And I can tell you a little bit more about this because my wife is a computer science teacher and she has got funding to make an esports team at school. Cool. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's, That's pretty, pretty cool. cool. Doesn't it take about 100 million quid to make an average game these days? Like, Call of Duty must have a (laughs) massive budget, even though it is a big steaming turd. I think the the aim here is to to support smaller independent companies and developers that are doing something more innovative, that are really pushing the boundaries, whether they've gone to Kickstarter or whether they've been privately funded as their initial investment. They're looking for a little bit more to take them to their second or third project, or to complete the first one. So the quote is, we are focused on innovative games and games technologies. We're gamers at heart and strongly believe in the positive power of play culturally, socially, and economically. It'll be really interesting to see how they kind of divvy that stuff up. Like how you, uh, how you qualify for it or how they, do they decide, do they decide who gets it or do you apply to them and then they every month or something mm. say, here's another chunk. Interesting to see how that pans out. I'm mm. going to find out, John, for you, because that's a really good question. I know of one uh, foolproof, foolproof way of getting loads of money. Are you sure? A What's scam, that? Steve. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> step one. So, <laughs> step one, take a game that somebody else has made and published on Game Crafter. Step two, put that game on Kickstarter. Step three, profit. I think you missed out one, actually. <laughs> Step 2A, don't get caught doing it. Well, like, step three yeah. is actually get caught doing it because most people in the games uh, community know games when they see it and recognise that this game has been made by someone else, including the game's designer, who basically just spam insulted this page. So this is a game called Dungeon Horde, which uh, hit Kickstarter, 
I think it was last week, and people quickly noticed that this game looked exactly the same, even to the point where the brand, as in the name of the company making it, was the same as the company producing games on Game Crafter. However, there was also a couple of little red herrings, like the uh, bio of this person who was publishing this game was almost a, was a copy and paste of another company to the point where they forgot to take out the address properly. <laughs> so the person, the scammer, was working out of Paris, and so Kickstarter says, you know, project based in Paris, but their bio said they were San Francisco. Skills. And they forgot to delete the, the rest of it, so it actually said Paris, San Francisco. Oh dear. <laughs> That's almost Trumpesque in its ineptitude. It is. Um and then of course people went onto the comment section and started picking holes in it. And this person who's running this Kickstarter started to respond to the comments. And rather than taking a level headed approach, decided to just swear at everyone. Yeah, that was hilarious. <laughs> Way to make yourself look professional. Swear at your potential customers and completely rip the lid off the entire scam in well, one fell swoop. Top what, job, sir. What was more interesting was f- and funnier was I was concerned was the skill, skill in end of inverted commas that he used to do this. It was such broken pigeon text English that he he could barely string a sentence together without littering it with obscenities it was hilarious you can go find that on <laughs> kickstarters now it's it's all still there it's well worth a read just because of how bad it is what's impressive as well is that it wasn't the only campaign he was running so almost uh ten, you know almost at the same time concurrently was another kickstarter he copied off another publisher of game crafter but he was clever enough to put them under two different um email addresses on Kickstarter. So they both appear to be made by a different project creator. Mm. But of course, he'd used his same name and address in both of them. So it's pretty <laughs> obvious to uh, even the... Uh... Was that wow. the Paris San Francisco address? <laughs> no, no, no. His actual address, as in the actual Paris address and his actual real name. Brilliant. Wow. No. Oh, and the bio. So yes, the bio was the same. So it did have the Paris San Francisco thing in his bio on both of them. Nice. Not too bright, this chap, is he really? No. No, but I no. do think it do has, for me, rung quite an impressive alarm bell that two campaigns so poorly stitched together managed to pass the Kickstarter's vetting process. It's it's weird, though, if you, you didn't realise you had the crappy pigeon English until he started commenting on things, though. Because mm, he just copy-pasted the text from the other one. Yeah. So the main text for the mm. Kickstarter and the images and all that were taken direct from Game Crafter. Mm. And this, this Dungeon Heist, which is game, uh, sorry, Dungeon Horde, sorry, uh, which the game is based on, mm. it's got proper graphic design in it. It looks nope. really pretty. It's got a video and everything. Yeah. Because he's just copied it from a Game Crafter. <laughs> yeah. But I'm still wow. a little bit concerned about the checks that Kickstarter do. Because other companies, the UK company, it was on Twitter earlier this week, and it was Sumo Gnomes from Robbie Mum. His Kickstarter go-live date was delayed because Kickstarter had gone, no, we've got to do some more, we've got to press the all-clear button. So his was delayed, and I think it was Cesar or, uh, name escapes me, Lewis from Braincrack Games. So that they've had it happen to their previous campaigns. Kickstarter had held up those legitimate projects that had multiple, you know, previous projects. So this new guy comes Mm. along, looks great, no checking behind the scenes to realise it's shite. Speaking of shite... Oh, God, this could be anything, right? (laughs) It could be anything. Well, no, it's this next article you've put down. It says Monopoly. Why? (laughs) We don't cover things like that, surely. Moving on, <laughs> the world's first ever Monopoly immersive 3D attraction is opening in Hong Kong on Saturday. Is it a stress okay. room where you can go in and batter them with hammers? No, it is. Uh, Literally, it's like a theme park, but a Monopoly theme park that you that you pay your ticket, you go in, you have to go in in a glass elevator, and you go into Mr. Mr. Moneybags' foyer, where he's got... You know, the little racing car from the original Monopoly? Mm -hmm. That, but life-size and gold-plated. Is it gold or is it silver? It's his one, it's gold. Okay. Then you walk around his house, which seeing various 
ode to all the different versions of Monopoly before you get into the theme park itself proper, where you can visit the railway station, which is a four-day, 4D cinematic experience, or you can go to the Waterworks or the Electric Company. 4D? Is that because you see it over and over and over and over <laughs> again every time you go around the board? <laughs> I don't. Sometimes that smell, sometimes it means... Movement and things, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's even a go to the community room where there's a giant spinning wheel and you can spin it and you can win actual stuff that include uh, meal vouchers or <laughs> VIP plane tickets. I think that's that's the bottom and the top of, pop end of it. And that's what it is. It's opening up in the peak, which is where in the Japanese version of Monopoly, that's where Mayfair or Broadway in the UK and the American version respectively Okay, it's absolutely balmy, and they're planning to open another one in Australia next year. It's it's not a small thing either. It's like twenty thousand square feet of yeah of attraction. It's this just... thing, and it's in the uh, most expensive part of Hong Kong. Two of the uh, world's most expensive properties are in that district. I suppose it's on point then. <laughs> that can't have much. That can't have much legs though. I mean, it'll be a, like a, a novelty thing for a sort of a year or so, and then everyone will realise, hang on a minute, just like the game, this is shit. I don't know. Hasbro and Dreams, the company have done this. They've invested an awful lot of money in this place. Mm. If you look at some of the pictures, mm. it's incredible what they've done with this place. It does look quite impressive. It's just a shame they didn't base it on a, a good board game, you know, like Talisman or something. <laughs> Thought that I'd get a good reaction. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> right, this last article that uh, we point towards confuses me a little bit, but this is news that Asmodee, or the you know, the Borg of board game publishers, <laughs> have announced uh, some while back that they were going to do a publishing division, as in a book publishing division called Aconite. And I've got to be fair, Asmodee have been really heavy pushing this because we get we get a lot of random press emails off different companies. And I've noticed this Aconite press release come through quite a few times and I've not given this company my email address. <laughs> so they found our email address somewhere and decided that we are the people to hear about this. And so this is... Originally the thought was going to be this was going to be publishing books are based around... You know, board game properties, much the same as Fancy Flight Games already do, because they already do a series of Netrunner novels, and they always do already do a series of Arkham Horror novels. They do Netrunner novels? Ooh. Yes. I did not know that. I quite like um... some of them are actually not bad. <laughs> okay. Really really endorsement. Endorsement. Yeah, I was say, wow, I was just enthusiastic there and Steve has just pissed on my fire. I I've I've looked at a few of them that none of them rate particularly highly on Goodreads. So Goodreads if you if you use it is the kind of like a you know social media for book reading. Most of them tend to get about three point five to three point nine kind of thing. So not out stellar of... books at five. Oh okay, that's not quite so bad. But to put it into context, they get kind of the similar level as most Warhammer novels get, yeah. as most uh, Dungeons & Dragons novels get, as most of the War Machine novels get. Basically, it's on the same kind of level as what you expect to one of these IP-related books. Mm. I just haven't got, I've got... I will actually read a couple of them. I just haven't got around to reading them because my shelf of reading shame makes my shelf of board game shame look like a small pile <laughs> in the corner as opposed to... you know. Do what I do. Just don't read. <laughs> oh, you don't have any books. You don't need to buy any books. You don't have any shame. Mm. Oh, but maybe you know, it's read. a bit like your board game collection, Andy. You're still there's still an impetus to buy them, even if you don't get around to playing them. Yes. Well, to be fair, I do have quite a few books I haven't read. But anyway, I'll have a look into this because uh, Netrunner's the Android universe, isn't it? Which is why I yes, quite like sorry. it. Sorry, and the Android books. Sorry, they, they, actually, because Netrunner is not the term they own anymore. So it is the Android is the term they own. So you're right. Yes, you shall look into that. Aconite have announced that they've teamed up with Marvel. Mm -hmm. Which confused the hell out of me because I was thought at first the headlines I saw were saying Asmodee teams up with Marvel. And it was supposed to be like this big news article. And I kind of went, well, don't we already know this? Aren't they doing a miniatures game already? And the card, yeah. And the card game, but this is so different. Mm -hmm. Am I right, Rory? You know a little bit more about this than I do. Well, I know slightly more than you about this than you do, Steve. Uh, slightly more is still more. (laughs) 
Aconite, as Steve said, are going to be publishing books starting next year. They're going to be publishing books based on Marvel superheroes, which is particularly odd since Marvel are technically a publisher in their own right. Oh, because they do the comic book. This, Those uh, are the yeah. comics, yeah. yeah. And I've got previous released Marvel stories, previous books. So I don't really understand why they're teaming up with Aconite. So you're going to be able to go into a board game shop, I guess, and buy a story, a book about Pandemic, and one about Iron Man, right next to each other. I don't really know what's going on. I think it's interesting, though. Bizarre. Mm. I do know that it's going to be lesser-known characters, so they're going to be covering some of Xavier's other students. So it's not going to be the big headline. So I joked earlier about Iron Man. It's going to be characters you don't normally hear about. Like Quicksilver and the, the, the Night Crawl or whatever his name is. I would bet it's even smaller. Wow. Interesting to see what comes out of this, because I do think it's, it still seems completely random mm. that Asmodea board game publisher are going to be writing novels about Marvel characters. <laughs> but maybe it's maybe it's just a deal to get a leg up so that it gets in people's, you know, get them noticed. But mm. I'm trying to think what, what how Z list you have to go on that scale to get in this in this category <laughs> now. Like the dishwasher <laughs> unloader, their magic power is that they can magically uh, load dishwashers to the most incredible <laughs> precision. It's not magic, John. It's a mutation. <laughs> have any of you watched uh, Lego Batman? Yes. Yes. When, when it lists all the, the uh, villains and they're all actual villains and they get sillier and sillier yeah. and sillier. Mm-hmm. Condiment King. Yeah, like the Condiment King. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Calendar Man and things like that. Yes, yes. That's yeah. bonkers. <laughs> That's what we can expect to read from Aconite in the, the okay. summer of 2020. We shall look out for it. And that concludes this week's news. John, Andy, you've been playing the hot game of the moment, I believe. Yeah! We have indeed. The hottest of hot games. Well, yes, the hot game at the moment is a Stonemaier one, obviously. (laughs) Uh, Which I didn't buy. Alora bought it. She's she's getting into, yeah, she's getting into the old Stonemaier groove now. So she's bought Mm. Wingspan, and now she has bought Tapestry. She is getting a lot of coverage at the moment. She pre-ordered it, so it turned up pretty much on sort of day one when it was all getting sort of thrown out the door. And we actually had to wait a couple of weeks before we could play it because we were on holiday. But I did take it with me so I could learn the rules. But we we came back, played a game of it, and then um, John came over on Friday, two days before we record this, and we played a three-player game of Tapestry. So I played it with a two-player and a three-player. And John won by a margin... Losers. Yes. <laughs> I was going to be a modest healthy about margin it. Or a slim margin? I was a healthy margin. It was about oh, 50% right. more than what Laura and I scored. Oh, Laura and I were two points with each other, either side of 160, and John scored something. Is it because you're, you're allowing John to write down his moves on a piece of paper? <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh... <laughs> I didn't ruin my dignity this time by trying to do that. I just <laughs> kept it all in my to. head. You don't really need to, to be honest. It's not that complicated. So Tapestry is a civilization building game uh, from Stonemaier, as mentioned. So this is actually designed by Jamie Stegmaier. So I think this is his fourth game now of, he says, 10. He says by the time he retires, he wants to have designed and produced 10 board games. Fifth one. There you go. Fifth one. Hmm. Yeah, it's heavily inspired by games like Civilization. So uh, if everyone's played that or Age of Empires or anything like that, that sort of sort of game, uh, there is a feel of that. So you are a civilization, which is kind of randomly drawn, and you go through five ages um, of evolution mm. in order to develop your civilization in order to score points to win prizes. Mm. You have four resources with which to do things. And ultimately, you are trying to develop yourself along four different tracks, which are around the board. And those different tracks will give you certain benefits. And you have a capital city, which is a sort of a nine by nine. It almost looks like a Sudoku grid onto which you can put buildings. So ordinarily, you've got a row of buildings on each of these four resource tracks. The buildings come off, which give you more resources every time you take income. And you can put the buildings in your capital city, and the more things you put there, the more resources and points you're going to score because you'll get all rows and columns of these things. 
and you generally do better. If you make technological breakthroughs by getting up these tracks at, at certain points, so you'll go through sort of four stages of these tracks, and each time you're the first person to get to one of these stages, you get a monument. So there's this box full of lovely, very well-made, very pretty um, buildings, miniatures. Completely unnecessary, but very pretty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they go onto your capital city, or... If you are one of the other civilizations, they actually go straight onto the main board, uh, on which is kind of a bunch of hexes, which you can use to explore the map and conquer your opponents, if you wish. John seemed very keen on conquering me. Well, I mean... You were. <laughs> till he tried and failed. <laughs> yeah, all right. So someone had to take that card. <laughs> I have to say, when you first look at this game, like straight straight away, you see this board. It's got a great big section of uh, hexes that you're supposed to explore and reveal as you go along. Then there's these tracks around the outside of the board. You've also got your player board that's got some bits and pieces on, and some expansions to the right and the left of that player board. One of those being this um, sort of grid area, and the other bit being your kind of special abilities. And I looked at all this stuff. I'm like, what is this game? There's like a thousand different mechanics and bits and pieces going on. And I was thinking, like, is this going to be one of these that is going to explode my brain and I'm going to spend, <laughs> like, 20 minutes every turn just like sitting there looking at it going, like, what the f*** do I even do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but predictably, as it is a Stonemaier game, it's actually quite straightforward. And although mm. there's a lot of stuff to do, like, at any given time, that you've got quite a narrow subset of that stuff to worry about. So there's lots of options to do, but it's all kind of done in a logical order and you can plan reasonably. So I didn't have to make any notes in Evernote. <laughs> I could just <laughs> keep enough of it in my head at any one time. I only screwed up on about four or five occasions, which is mercifully about four or five less occasions than the other guys did. <laughs> Pretty much. I was about to say probably about four or five times less than I did. I got to about two thirds of the way through the game, looked at my capital as I do it. Oh, for <laughs> sake. I have completely ruined this because the idea is that you're supposed to put them down in an efficient manner so you can complete rows and columns yeah. or um, sections of the of the sort of 3x3 three three section of this 9x9 nine nine grid. I said like it like a, like a Sudoku almost. And when you complete the 3x3, three three, you'll get a resource. If you complete a row or a column, you'll get a victory point in the next sort of scoring section. And I looked at it and went, well, I should have put that building there and that building there and that building there and that would have all worked. But no, I've got them higgledy-piggledy mess and it looks like downtown, I don't know, Leicester. So the thing to bear in mind with this is that <laughs> this um, this grid area that Andy mentions, it's not just like an empty grid. There's actually like little obstacles in there. There's sort of terrain that you have to avoid. Mm. So every time you do an upgrade on your board by reaching a certain point on one of these tracks on the main board, you take one of these little tokens off your player board and put it onto this little capital city area. So it's a little bit scythe-like in that as you progress through the game, you're uncovering options, and it makes you more powerful in those particular tech trees. Mm. It's funny you should say that, Jay, uh, John, actually, because I know you said it on the Friday as well. You said it reminds you of scythe, and that's exactly what I thought the first time I played it. I thought, well, basically, I'm playing scythe. Sli slightly lighter than scythe, but basically scythe. didn't feel really? that different weight-wise to me. Mm. Yeah, I Is suppose. there enough of a distinction? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the mechanics the of the game is very, very different. It's a very the overall different game. feel of the game is actually very similar. In the sense, it's multiplayer solitaire. And whilst there is a big map in the middle with hexes on it that you move around in, there's not actually a huge amount of player interaction. I would say there's definitely more in this. Because Agreed. you're actually conquering one another's territories. You're knocking... So when you explore, you, pl you place down a little token... Um, and, that, and that's fine. Like You can keep exploring as you want across the hexes that you reveal as you go through the game. Once you've joined up with another player's territory, if they've got a piece down there and you expand onto theirs with your military token, you basically knock their, their token over and you then control that rather than them. Mm. But they can't ever co come back on that. So you're kind of... You do want to expand... But at the same time, you don't want to be the first one to expand necessarily because, <laughs> because then you'll have an, well, they'll have an opportunity to then give you good kicking. Mm. Or re-expand okay. backwards. So, yeah, it's... The, I mean, the, the, the conquest action is very limited. There's no dice rolling or anything. It is literally just, I am going to conquest you and bang, I'll kick you over and that's it. There's nothing you can do about it. But as Apart John mentioned, that, there take are, that card. Yeah, there are a couple of cards in the deck um, called Tapestry Cards. Usually they're made to, at the start of each age, you'll play one of these and it'll have either a one-time effect or an ongoing effect for a particular age. 
or you'll get these um, trap cards, basically. So if somebody tries to conquer, you can play the trap card, and it's kind of a no! And yep. the person dominated, trying to conquer is, is, in, is, in fact, themselves conquered. But that's it. Mm. Once there's two tokens on a single hex, that's it. You can't. Nobody can ever go and play there again. So it is a limited level of conquest and domination. So you can't just keep fighting over the same territory. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's quite interesting that it's capped like that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you can't be too much of a dick. Could so you be a, first... a, a repetitively a dick to the same player? I mean, could yeah. you could you yeah. just keep picking on John, but there's there's only on the second layer? Uh, you won't be able to, t- to conquer the same hex. You can't keep attacking the same hex. As I say, there's, mm. once there's two of yeah. these little towers but you on could, them, that's it. But, but you, you could keep attacking one. John's hex. Yeah, 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 apart from yeah. one. when you're, The starting one always starts with two, so you can never be taken. You can always expand from somewhere. In the game, there's probably... I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but it's something like four or five chances you'll get to do these expansions. Mm. Like there's, There is a limited number of times that you can do this. Yes. How long... There are special actions as well, but yeah, John's right. How long does it play for? I've heard it's quite a long game. It is. We played for about two and a half hours, I think it was. Yeah. And we started at about half seven, and we played until about ten. But that was with learning as well. Yeah, uh, I was quite surprised that it was such a long game. From, from from the little I've heard of it, I wasn't expecting it to be such such a consuming game. It didn't well, feel a... long. No, we playing, you're always it thinking. Feel like it dragged. But there is a there is quite a lot of downtime in it. I mean, that downtime will be massively decreased once you understand what you're doing in the game. So once you've played mm. it a couple of times, your turns will be much much quicker. Again, a bit like Scythe. Um, because you're only doing literally one thing on your turn. So at five points in the game, you will do what's called an income action, mm-hmm. which will essentially starts a new age of development for your your civilization, where basically you get a bunch of resources and a few cards and other bits and, and a chance to score some points. At all other times, you're basically doing an advancement, which basically means you move up on one of these four tracks, mm-hmm. and that's your turn. It's li- this is why John said it was quite straightforward to play, because you are literally doing one of those two things, and that's it. Now, you can chain a few things together when you do one of these actions. So, like, it'll give you the chance to do, say, some conquest and maybe take off a building from one of these income tracks, put that down, and if you put that down, it might complete a set so you can get another resource, which means you can do something else. So the the skill of the game really is to chain all of these things together, which is yep. something John managed to do and something Alora and I did not manage to do. <laughs> <laughs> we did it a bit, just not as effectively. Yeah, now, the one thing I will say about this, and I think it is to its detriment, is there is a lot of randomness in it. That's fair. Really? Yeah. That it's very, it's one of the biggest criticisms well. of it. It's quite... I, I found that as well. For, considering Stonemaier are generally quite euro uh, and generally sort of low look, or at least controlled look, there is a lot of randomness in this because there are two decks of cards. There's the Tapestry cards, which are kind of these sort of major benefit cards, and you can get a bunch of them and choose which one you want to play. You play one of those in each era. Yes. Everyone plays one, and it'll generally affect what happens in the next era, so it'll give you some bonuses in a particular way, or give you some extra resources or something along those lines. Yeah. Okay. Um, Or there are technology cards, so you base inventions, essentially. So there'll be like something like transistors or toothpaste or telecommunications or things like that. So this is like a a, a civilization will invent, you know, the mobile phone. And there's a couple of stages on a little track that you put these cards in every income phase and a couple of stages on the, the, the development tracks. You can upgrade one, and there's only two stages to upgrade. There's limits to what you can upgrade and when you can do it, but ultimately when you upgrade it, you'll get a benefit, like you'll get mm-hmm. some points or you'll get a resource or you'll get something else. And there's no limit to the number of tech cards you can have, but again, they're all random. They come from a very limited market. But ultimately, obviously, they'll come out and they're random. So your 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 civilization might invent the laser before it invents, I don't know, toothpaste, for example. Which is so it's a bit screwy. There's no real timeline in the game, which is a bit odd. So there's no tech tree either. So it's no. not like your traditional kind of Sid Meier's civilization where everything goes down, you know, irrigation, pottery, granary, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, no, it doesn't follow that at all. It is literally just random technology. Um okay. Do you and find then, that quite so, jarring when you're playing it then? Yeah, it's really Does it odd. Does key into that theme? It just doesn't really work. No, it's... The theme is very light, I would say. It's more about the mechanics. It feels nice. I didn't really... Most of the time, I wasn't really looking at the theme. 
Mm. Like it, it wasn't so prevalent. It didn't tie in that well that I was thinking, oh, yeah, next I'll invent this other thing. Andy kept on going on about how he was going to, I don't know, invent telecommunications or something. And I looked down at the board for the first time after about an hour. I was like, oh, yeah, these things are labelled with like food <laughs> and telecommunications. And I'd just been focusing on like what things I needed to uncover to get to the next well, that's yeah, basically because I wanted was. to build the BT tower on my board because there's a there's a miniature of it with all the satellite dishes on the side of it. So it just looks <laughs> like a BT we're, tower. I think we're starting to see now why I might have won. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when you do com when you do um conquest, you roll mm. two dice and you'll pick one of these things. And on one of them, generally, you'll score a number of VPs. And on the other one, you can score, say, a resource of some some kind, and you choose one. And basically, pretty much every time, John rolled the seven, which is like the maximum number of points you can get on one of these dice. And he did it something like four times. So he got 28 Ooh. points, but pretty <laughs> much nothing, which is a bit annoying. To be fair, I did yeah. go all the way up that track. So I You was... did. That is true. I went for a, a science-based uh, civilization, got to the end of that track, and discovered it really wasn't worth it. But when you go up the science track, you roll a D12, and that allows you to advance up one of the other three tracks at random for nothing. Sometimes you get the benefit of it, sometimes you won't, depending on where you are. So you're kind of basically sciencing the shit out of the rest of your civilization. <laughs> um, so in that way, it kind of works, if you think about it. But again, it's random. You can't plan which of those tracks you'll advance on. So you can't mm. think, well, I'll definitely advance on, say, the, the invention track, because that'll get me more stuff. You've got to think, well, roll the die and see what happens. Oh. There is quite a lot of... Um, I know that does sound random. There are quite a few random bits in it. But a lot of these things, um, to play well, I felt like I could see that there was going to be some randomness coming up. So I'd just try and diversify the bits and pieces that I had around that. So that if the worst came to the worst, I'd still be able to make use of what I got from that stuff. Mm. Yeah, okay. But there, you're right, there are times where it doesn't matter how carefully you plan or how many um, coping strategies you've got around your choices, <laughs> uh, sometimes the dice will just be like, no, you're not going to get that. Or someone will have that take that card and it's like, I've got this perfect laid plan, I put my piece here and I get all the points. No, no you don't, John. No, because I'm going to conk you back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pretty well, that much, was a wasted yeah. move then. So it's, yeah, it can be nice to plan it, and other times you just can't. So it's a little incongruous, I think. Mm. Interesting. So, Steve, question for you then. Yeah. Does it sound like John and Andy enjoyed this game? Does it sound like they think it's a good game from what they've just said? Because I can't tell. No, I can't either. It, it's fr from what they're saying. It sounds almost average. Yeah, and it's it's a game that's seventy odd rips for this. It's, it's I think isn't it is a hundred rips Barbara P or is it? So, well, Laura paid seventy. I think it was. Yeah, yeah just, so that's gonna be more than that than it. Yeah. Mm. I've just gone to board game prices and the top four results are all on pre order again, so they've all sold out. But it's sixty four to sixty eight quid in total across those four. But still, it's a lot of money. It is, yeah. The, the problem is, I as nice as it is, it does suffer a little from Grim Forest Syndrome. Uh, see, now, I did wonder that. When I saw that price and saw that box mm. and saw those little miniatures of the buildings, which look a little bit like they should belong in an old deer's display cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, with a little dog. <laughs> yeah. I did wonder, uh, you know, they look seriously blinged. And I know that when you got Scythe, you got all the, you know, you got the robot tractors and what have you, but they still look like miniatures. They're still like usable pieces. Whereas those things, they looked overly blinged, if, if, you know, when, when you yeah. first saw them. And I was worried that this is going to be an unnecessary expense. And of course, when I saw that price, when it first came out, I was like, <sighs> Okay, I'm, I'm going to wait for the first wave of reviews to come out before I go get that. If that had been like 50 quid, I think. You know, still my game at 50 quid, I would have gone, yeah, what the hell, let's mm, give it a try. Mm. But at, yeah, you know, 60 quid north of 60 quid, I kind of went, I'm going to wait until the first reviews come out. And I've got to admit, what you two are saying now is making me feel like I made the right decision. I have to admit it's not his best. That is my stance. I, mm. I really enjoyed the game. Oh. I do think yeah. that for that kind of money, it, it feels overpriced. But I also think that 
It didn't need those buildings in it. Agreed. If you if you had tiles or like much cheaper, smaller miniatures in their mm. place, the game wouldn't have felt any less for it. I mean, they look pretty, don't get me wrong, but in terms of like their actual use in the game, for a while I was like, what do they actually do? And then I was like, okay, <laughs> so they go down on that grid bit and basically rather than plonking down one resource token at a time, you can block out nine resource tiles over here. Like I, I got to the... Um, was it the tank factory or something? And it was basically a nine square chunk. So one of my blocks on my board was just like, douche, there we go, free resource. And that's uh, much closer to getting all the rows in that particular section mm. of the board done. Exactly. Mm. But again, nothing you can't do with a tile, for example. You don't need the miniature. So like you've mentioned side, Steve, where you've got your robot tractors, they actually serve a purpose. You know, you move yeah. it around, it's a piece, and it does take up space, it represents something on the board, and you move it around and you do use it. Whereas yeah. once this building is down, that's it. It doesn't do anything else. Wow. It just sits and yeah. looks pretty. So it just sits there. Mm. Yeah. It... That's increasing the production cuts. Then the box is going to yeah. have to be so much bigger to store it all, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which means the amount you can actually fit into a freight container is reduced. and mm -hmm. It just seems daft. Mm. It's, I mean, yeah. the rest of it is lovely. The cards are nice. The actual player board and, and the actual gaming board are really, really nice. They're all covered in this kind of plasticky, rubbery stuff. Mm. Um, so it feels really quite rough and nice, but it is completely waterproof because, you know, beer is mandatory when you play. So if you spill any, it's <laughs> fine. Um, but other than that, the, yeah, as I say, it's Grim Forest Syndrome. They look lovely, wonderful, but mm. yeah, they just don't really like add it. that much. So I think it's unnecessary cost. Because there's definitely less in the box than than Scythe. There's less in the box than arguably Viticulture. To a point. Yeah, I would I'd put a caveat a little bit on those two in that Viticulture and Scythe came via Kickstarter. True. So the budgeting and such like, although they they're now available in retail, the their route to market is very different. Mm. Because um, I noticed that you know the last three stone my games and Chatterstone wasn't too bad, but you know Wingspan is not a cheap game either. No, for what's in there? I mean, again, there's, there's a little bit of unnecessary bling. That little three card holder I think is completely superfluous, and the bird box I also think is yeah, agreed. Waste well, it's time. nice on the table, but it's a bit of a waste of time. And I, and I got to admit, that's is it fifty five quid for Wingspan? Something like that. Feels... Yeah, it's not cheap. Which feels a little bit excessive. Although I do like the little mini eggs. I do like the Cadbury's mini eggs. Yeah, the eggs are that. lovely. And, and the thing is, they serve a purpose, so that's not so bad. It yeah. tastes very good, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think overall tapestry is... I mean, the gameplay is fine. One thing, I, another thing I will say, actually, is the rule book is not the best. It's not terrible. You surprised me. Yeah, this is the thing. It's condensed. It, yeah, it's been... Oh. It's been lightened, I think. Oh, wasn't it famous for being like a four-page rule book? It is. It was like yeah, it's literally a pamphlet. Right, okay. Um, which is great, and it makes it nice and approachable, and it's easy to teach, and you can read through and go, oh, right, this is this is fine. It's not scary because you're not reading through War and Peace mm. like you do in something like Eclipse. And you think, great, it's not intimidating. I can start to play it. But then you do start to play it, and you ever you get little, little niggles that you're like, well, what happens here? And you look in the rule book, and there's nothing. Uh, or yeah, you've got so a hundred like a little tiny detail. sentence that's been kind of it's yeah it is i think it's been oversimplified yeah cramming it into four pages doesn't actually make it any easier to find things it just means <laughs> that you need to have better eyesight <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> do you know, do you know the, just a, a very slight aside we talked about cooper island on the essen podcast last our last episode and I said, oh, this is like the super heavy euro that Andy will probably like. I had a quick look at the rule book because I realised that I did, I did really bad at describing that game because I didn't really understand it. So I thought I'd have a quick look at the rule book. It's a 40 page rule book. Whoa! Oh, I'm yeah. totally buying that game. <laughs> <laughs> it did sound pretty good from what you said, actually. I got, I got the gist. So, <laughs> But yeah, so I mean, I think possibly John and I have been a little harsh on Tapestry. It's not a bad game. I, I also think. Like what we've described so far may have sounded like there was more randomness than there really is. It's just that in the game that we played with us, um, I happened to roll quite a lot of high victory point scores from those dice rolls. But there's nothing mm. stopping the other guys doing the same. It's not like they went along the same track and rolled really low. 
Like Alora got one or yeah, two okay. good rolls out of it. Just I just went all the way on that track, yeah, and you yeah. get more chances to do it. Mm. It's true. Mm. It's fair. I mean, it's. I'd like to think. I, th- I think this is one of the sort of games that you're going to need to play a lot in order to see all the balance issues and all the, the 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 outcomes. I mean, Jamie is actually running a live analysis as people play it around the world to actually see which civilizations. Because you basically get a card that says this is what your civilization does, and they all have different skills and they all have abilities and stuff. And the the obviously combinations of all of these things compared to where you are on the board. They're, they're keeping a running total of to see which ones are more powerful and which ones get more wins mm. more often and so on and so forth. So they're potentially considering introducing um, handicaps potentially later on. I mean, it's a bit early at this point okay. in the game, uh, in time, but it, there may be, you know, live updates to rules in future. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. The other point we okay. haven't covered yet, which is an important point to make, is that um, in no, in most games, you play through an age and you each take a turn, you take a turn, you take a turn, and then that's the end of the age. In this game, you can actually affect or choose to some extent when you want the age to fit to finish for yourself. And that doesn't affect anyone else. So if I've managed to stretch out, and I did several times, um, how many resources I had available in a given uh, age, I'd end up my the age that I played through would be like two or three turns longer than some of the than uh, Elora and Andy, mm. which means that you can end up with a situation where one person's finished their game, and they're done, and everyone oh. else is still going. Yes. Oh, it's that's slightly is, asymmetric. That's so basically, you can do what I did and burn through all your resources really quickly, and you're sat there going at the end of the game, going, "Right, I'm done." Open the whiskey and just sit there and drink. Uh, when the other two were basically playing for, it must have been about another twenty minutes or more yeah. uh, that you oh. guys were playing. I don't know. So I'm sort of sat there with my thumb up my Yeah, that's the thing. You're like, yeah, in, in it's a, very you odd. Know, in an age when we're supposed to have got rid of like player elimination, and you have a game where player elimination is a really bad thing, well, it's self elimination, isn't it? You get to the point where you say, "Well, I finished," and then everyone else has got to try and catch up to you or beat you. It's not like they're running away with it or they're doing it differently it's just that they've used all their resources so far so it's not like you're thinking now i've got to catch up yeah but surely you mean you know where they are in the game then you've got an idea of how many victory points they've got yes mm. there's that so you know do you, i mean it was there a point when you just kind of went well andy's finished now well we know john's beating him so is there any point carrying on that happen i did say that actually i mean half joking <laughs> obviously we're going to let people play but it got what? to the point where it's like i was ahead of john by a margin but John had like half yeah. an age and his final scoring to go, so there's a bloody good chance he was going to beat me, and obviously he did. Um, so it did. We well, we mentioned it very briefly in jest to say, "Is there any point in carry on?" I think John's fairly safely won this. And John said, "No, I want to see how much I've won. <laughs> <laughs> yes, how much I can pound you into the floor." So oh, yes, there is that element to it. Okay. It is. So, I mean, it needs to be played to be understood and pre- appreciated fully. It isn't a bad mm. game. It's worth playing. I really but... enjoyed it. Mm. <laughs> the fact that I won may have something to do with that. Possibly, yes. Now, the thing is, I think I'm suffering from wingspan syndrome on this as well. What's wingspan what syndrome, then? Uh, well, remember when wingspan came out, I was very lukewarm about it. Um, but yeah. the more I've played it, the more I'm interested in it and the the less shit I think it is. So I had a similar thought, you see, because I remember we said, when we when we talked about Wingspan on this very podcast, we said uh, we're both kind of nonplussed by it. I doubt it will make our Game of the Year lists. But let's see what happens mm. come December. And I had a quick look at what games have come out and what I would... Because usually what we do is when we do our Game of the Year, we pick three each, don't we? So, you know, Mm -hmm. because we can't just, we can't do a top 10 of absolutely everything. I looked at it and thought, do you know what? Wingspan's going to be in that top three at this rate. Now, I don't know if that's because Wingspan is better than what I first, what my first impression said, or whether there's just been bugger all else of worth this year. I don't know. But yeah. (laughs) I, the more I've, I've played it twice, three times now, and I am more interested in it now than I was to start with. I know I was quite interested in it, but I'm not as plussed as I am over other Stonemire games. I mean, I would yeah. much rather play something like Euphoria, Scythe, or um, Viticulture than I would this. That's interesting. I mean, I've only played Scythe once. 
but I feel like it felt like there were more options. There was a bit more to do in Tapestry versus Scythe. Probably, I think that's probably fair, yeah. So that was Tapestry from Stone My Games. I'm undecided whether I want to play that or try it. Right, let's talk about something different. So I've been playing Slyville from Hexy Studios. It's a pre-order now, available and pick up at Essen. It's a three to five player game of stabbing each other in the back mercilessly until someone is less dead than you are. Take my money! (laughs) (laughs) As as much as I know about this game and I'm in. I was... I was trying to describe this to uh, to someone the other day, and I it's you don't play this game to win it. You play this game to make everybody else lose more than you. How's that distinct from any other game? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that's the polyhedron collider way of playing games. <laughs> yeah. We don't play to win. We play to make sure everyone else loses. I Especially genuinely Steve. think that if I were to play this with you guys, there would be tears at the end of the game. <laughs> yep, that's going to be Why a four for we four. Played this so. <laughs> I'll get it over to you guys so you can have a blast at it. But it's a, got a really simple premise. You're in the city of Slyville and there are five different districts, each in a different colour and each has a different resource that it creates. So the pub gives away rum. The the armoury gives, gives away a, rum. Well, it has rum as a, <laughs> as a resource so in the pub district, drinking district, which is also the docks, actually. So um, the observer, observatory and the library have books, the religious artefacts from the temples the bank gives you money and so on and so forth so there's five of them five colors five players and each one has a different stack of deals which you're trying to accomplish a big deal and a little deal so it's go collect these resources and then tree trade those resources in for deals and then you win those deals before everybody else really simple except for the fact that the way you do this is managed by your hand of cards seven cards everybody has the same seven cards that allow you to do certain actions. Now you're only going to play some of those cards in a five player game that you'd only be playing three of these actions. And these actions include sabotage, the ultimate dick move. You've got move your henchman, which is the almost ultimate dick move. <laughs> John's eyebrows just rose a little there. <laughs> I can't control them, it's not my fault. <laughs> ultimate dick He had me at say. dick moves. Hmm. <laughs> so sabotage allows you to trump anybody else's card that's on that stack. So in your turn, Steve, you'll choose one of your five actions. You'd place a card at the district where you want to activate that action. You play it face down, and we all do this in turn, in turn, round and round it goes. At the end of the round, we turn that stack of cards over, and they're all numbered. And then we play them in that order of the number to work out which are. So Steve, you choose to do a sabotage action. John and myself try um, try to go for the big deal or to move the henchman, you choose which one of us you're going to screw over. Nice. It's really simple, and it's so horrible, because as soon as someone, anyone, puts <laughs> any card down on any district, you're thinking, is that their sabotage card? Are they trying to do this? Mm-hmm. Are they trying to do that? How am I going to get around that? How am I going to stop them doing it? But I only have one card that can really stop you. Or do I think, you're trying to bid for those goods. You're trying to get all that gold... So I'm going to outbid you, but then the next card you put down is a sabotage. Therefore, my big bid, you're just going to dick it off. <laughs> you've run away with it, and you've just gone for a low bid, and you've just screwed me completely. I wasn't even thinking about that, and you just... Inconceivable. Inconceivable. It's a really nice, because you play these cards, it's really quick. You've got a plan, you know exactly what you want to do, how to do it. And the turn order moves, and it's uh, the the player turn order, the turn order of the districts of how they fire off. So you set up a game, so it starts at the dock, and every turn it's just going to circle around. So you can chain your actions together so you can get the resources you need to be able to pay off the deal that you want just in time. First person to 100 points ends the game. Everyone plays one more round of complete backstabbing, and that's it. (laughs) It's brutal. Sounds easy. It sounds like fun. It is fun. There is one problem I have with it, though. Mm. One problem is that in the event of a tie, so Steve and I have both played the sabotage card. In the event of a tie, whoever is the prince's favourite chooses 
whose card trumps whose. They're both rank one cards. So if Andy is the prince's okay. favourite, Andy chooses that Steve, you can dick on Rory. <laughs> <laughs> How do nice. you get the prince's favourite? This is this is the major wrinkle with it. Andy has done nothing to earn the prince's favourite except be in the turn order. It's literally the first player marker. It moves around. You become the prince's favourite, and you have run of the place. You ignore any tie breaks. You always, always put yourself as the better half. But that rotates around, yeah. It does rotate around, but it's still not very pleasant when you're at the mercy of somebody else's decision. When they've done nothing to earn it. Okay. <laughs> if on the previous round Andy had played a card, so he'd played the prince's favourite card, so. Rather than do any actions, he'd stolen the prince's favourite from you, John. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Then Andy sacrificed his last move to do this. I mm. get it. I understand it. But all he's done is just wait his turn. And it's even worse when Andy doesn't give a rat's ass about who wins this. So Steve and myself, he doesn't care. And he's unconcerned who wins. He's not invested in that, that district. Steve wins. Rory wins. Whatever. I don't care. He's, he's unconcerned. But he knows that Rory's going to throw his toys out of the pram. So Rory, <laughs> unlucky, mate. <laughs> and the rule book does say that you can barter and negotiate and plead whoever is with the prince's favourite. So next turn, I will do this for you to help you out. But you can't trade resources as such, but you can make these promises. But when I've played it, it's just a waste of time trying to say that to everybody because they just want to cause the most pain. <laughs> yeah, that, wouldn't, that would have no bearing in a game at the PHC. We we need we need to play this. We need to play this. That's uh, Slyville from Hexy Studios. That's the ticket. Nice. Now another game which is all about bribery and backstabbing and screwing everyone else over is one me and John played a few weeks back now actually, which is Conspiracy: The Solomon Gambit. Is this the Restoration Games one? Yes, ah. I was about to say, this is actually quite an old game. This is a Restorations game re uh, remake. So it's actually a game from the 70s, and it's all about kind of 70s spy. So, you know, imagine the Saint, an early Bond, and kind of, you know, Man from Uncle, that kind awesome. of thing. Yeah, done. And what you're trying to do is there is a briefcase in the middle of the board. So the board is this really cool map of Europe, which has got all little like uh, notes on to represent all the cities, and a little red string tied around about you know, nails in a board to represent the paths between all these different cool. cities. And the middle of the board is a briefcase, and you have to get that briefcase to your country. Mm -hmm. So four players will sit on four corners of the board, and there's, each person has to get the briefcase to their part, part of the board. But you don't have any pieces on the board. What you've got... Not your own six pieces. agents. Well, no, yeah, you don't, you don't have any agents. You don't have anything on the board itself that belongs to you. What instead there are six agents... And every turn, you'll basically say, I will use this agent. And all the agents can move and all the agents can carry the briefcase, but each one has also got a special ability, which is generally, to summarise, uh, push or pull another agent, so pull them, push them, toward, pull them towards them, push them away, push or pull the briefcase, or there's one that can, or two that can move fast, so one can actually move an extra two spaces, and one can use there's a subway system, so there's a mm. train system goes around all the major cities in the centre of the board, and they can do that quicker than other players. But you have a little secret board, and you have these little gold guineas. Right. And what you're doing is, on your turn, you can either take an action, which is to move one, try, you know, attempt to move one of these players. And I get to the attempt in a second, or you can bribe agents, which is basically on the board. You take some gold from your reserve and place it on top of that agent. When you announce, "Oh, I'm going to use this character," I can't. Sorry, the names of the agents have completely escaped me. But you say you're going to use the blue agent. You then have to go around the board, around the table, and everyone ever has to pass. And if they pass, it means they allow you to use that character. Or they go, no, I've bribed this character. I'm going to stop you. And then a bidding war starts. You've got like Spyglass and Vagabond and Tempest. Yeah, that's and... it. They've all got like code names. Yep. So then a bidding war starts. And you're only allowed to bid up to the amount of gold guineas you have on your character behind your screen. So I might say I'm going to use Tempest, and John goes, no, I bid one. And what usually happens is, one, I'll say two, three, because you don't want to let people know exactly how many guineas you've got on there, but as soon as you're outbid, one person wins. 
you have to have you, more you have to say more if you say yeah, the, you have to say amount it's no good yes you have to say more if you're challenging and you cannot say more than what you've what you've actually put on this character so do you put this the, the guineas on the characters at the beginning of the game no you can't move them but your action is either move one of the use one of the agents or put guineas oh, onto one of the okay. characters mm, right and I'll get onto that in a little bit in a minute because that causes issues at lower player counts, actually. Um, so what's happening is, as you're doing things, you'll say, oh, I want to use Tempest, and John goes, ha, oh, no, you won't. I'm going to outbid you. Now, if John wins the bid as he's contesting it, it means my turn's over. I've wasted a turn. If I win the bid as being the player whose, whose turn it is, John is then limited. So on his turn, he can only put guineas on. He can't take any actions. So there's a little bit of a risk here. If you try and stop someone, you end up losing, then you can't do as much on your turn. You can also burn agents. Now, it costs a lot of guineas to do this. It doesn't happen very often, but you can basically assassinate another agent. It's called burning an agent, which is remove them from the game. No. Which is great when someone else has put, like, shitloads of guineas on that agent, <laughs> and you know because yeah. they've just announced it, like... Aha, well, I've got eight. Like, God damn it. I needed to get that bit. Right, fine. Next time you're getting burnt. <laughs> <laughs> Bang. Yeah, basically that. And once that character's burnt, they're out of the game, which then limits the amount of options you've got. Mm-hmm. The other thing is it can end in a stalemate. So you've actually got an extra character in the game, which is Dr. Solomon, hence why it's called the Solomon Gambit. And you can give him a guinea as well. And if no one has got the briefcase to their home base, by the by the end of the game, which is a number of rounds, you start rolling a dice, which has got one has one or two faces have got Dr. Solomon on, and if it ever comes up with this Dr. Solomon, it's the end of the game, he's got the briefcase, and whoever has paid him off the most is now the winner. Ooh. Oh, okay. So you're constantly kind of waging, do I want to move that person to try and get the briefcase close to me versus... Do I need to pay a bit more so I've got a bit more influence so that I can win any contesting bits and pieces? Or do I think that this is all a crock of shit and the only way I'm going to win this is if I've got the most influence on Dr. Solomon? Sod it, let the others fight it out. I'm just going to keep adding to that guy. So let me just get this straight. So if you've got the briefcase and you're on an agent and it's running towards your corner, John, and I've got one of those characters that allow me to push or pull, I could just pull him back like a giant magnet and just start pulling you back away from your corner. Uh, but this is it. As I said, you never control, directly yeah. control an agent. On your turn, you can activate an agent mm-hmm. and use their ability. Yeah. So you could you could activate one agent. John could activate the same agent on the same on his turn. But you're right. What generally tends to happen is this briefcase zips around like a pinball. pinball. Mm. As people push, pull, and there's also there's a point when you don't actually win, but everyone, somebody goes, ah, John's won. Because somebody suddenly realises and goes, well, John can actually get it there in his action. Can anyone stop them? Yeah. No, because we know how many cup crowns everyone's bid on that person. Bugger, John's one's nothing we can do about it now. And there's a, there's, a, there's a certain point of like, well, can anyone put like ten crowns on this and stop him and challenge him? And everyone's like, no. Mm. For the record, but you're right. John didn't win. John was quite grumpy <laughs> no, no. about that. <laughs> <Cow's fire. laughs> so you're right, it pings pongs. And I, I touched on it a little bit earlier. We played a four player game with John, but I've also played it two players since. Now it says it's for two to four players, and this game does not work at two players. Really? Because the beauty about a four player game is everyone can be doing something different. So when we see that John's edging towards his corner of the base with Tempest, I'm going to use that example again, then everyone else starts piling the the bids onto Tempest to try and stop him. But in a two-player game, you're basically like, well, do I move the briefcase or do I put money on? And it's like, yeah, you're, you, 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 you can't rely on someone else to have done the things that need to stop the winner. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. It's- so it ends up being... Whoever bids the most person on one character early on tends to win, unfortunately. Mm. The other thing is that if you've got um, more people in the game, not everyone's going to mind if the briefcase is kind of heading across to these two people's side of the board. Mm. Well, it's, you know, it's okay, it's going towards them, but it's also coming towards me, so I'm not going to contest this one. I'm going to line up another agent to be ready to snatch it from them just as they're heading towards that person's board. 
except then some of the bugger will block that move. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, okay. see, I remember when I heard about this game first, reissuing this game, and it sounded absolutely brilliant. And I'm, even from what you've said, i really like to try this game. It's weird mm. in that this is a game from the 70s that feels very different to everything else that's coming out right now, almost the point of feeling fresh and new. <laughs> you know, with so many worker placement games, so many, you know, of these economic Euro kind of things, and this feels very different. It's simple, just this push and pull in and back and forth of these, these agents across this board. Does it feel old, though? Does it have that retro feel to it? I didn't think so. No, I mean, of course, it's been done in a style to make it look like, as yeah. I said, the 70s, you know, like Satan, Man from Uncle and all that. But it doesn't feel like an old game to me. The one aspect that does sort of feel a little bit old is it did feel like most games would probably end in some sort of stalemate where you were just pulling the briefcase around in circles. But I've only played one game of it, so I can't say that for certain. It just felt a bit towards the end, like it was... It was getting a bit close over there and then getting a bit close over here and then we made one slip up and it's like, oh, well, Kaz can just run away with it now. <laughs> and yeah, and that, that's what it was. It was. It did feel at first like if it feels a little bit frustrating actually because mm. it is bouncing back and forth so much. And there was a point when you're playing and you go, well, how on earth can you win this game? Because no one can actually get an edge over someone else. But then all of a sudden it just went and it was done. Oh. I was like, oh, why did we all miss that one? Mm. Yeah. Because as, I mean, I, I think four player is best for this because for the reason John said earlier, four corners of the board, you don't mind, you know, it heading to south of Europe when you're in the southwest corner, but then all of a sudden someone manages to divert it to the northeast, and you're like, well, how did that happen? Kind of thing, you know. Did you feel disappointed when those when you were hamstrung like that? Did you feel disappointed, or was it surprise, or from a game point of view, was it engaging an action to happen? It, as I said, it feels a bit frustrating mm. because it feels like you're making no progress. Yeah. Or you feel Which, like you're making progress, but then it doesn't take a lot for one other person to go, nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Afraid not, John. You're not taking that briefcase that way because I'm going to block you. And there's nothing you yeah. can do about it because I've still got the most points on whichever one that one was. Beacon, was it? One of them. <laughs> Roulette. That was it. Yeah. Oh yeah, roulette. Everyone was everyone was putting money on roulette on that one. Like, fine, I'll spend um, a turn having all the money on roulette. Great, I've got that. Oh crap, the briefcase over the other side of the board. She's nowhere near it anymore, and she never will be for the rest of the game. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 an interesting game. I I feel as if although we played it a few times now, I feel as if to get the most out of it, as I said, you ha- need maximum four players, which is not something I'm managing to get very often at the moment, unfortunately. I feel as if um, you know, it, it, I wonder as well whether you've played with four players who really know the game, whether it's going to become much more chess-like and much more kind of cunning. Mm. But you could see it then, and you could see the, the spite starting to go, well, I'm going to put money on the roulette character just to spite John. <laughs> <laughs> just to stop him from doing what he wants. Why would he? No, exactly. It does seem like a fairly standard tactic. Mm. Anyone playing a board game with me? <laughs> How long did it take to play? We played about an hour and a half. That's not so bad. Four play game. I was not expecting that. I thought it'd be a bit shorter. No, because as I said, and that's the slightly frustrating feeling. And well, it, it's limited. It's time limited. So it's an, I think it's twenty turns in the four player and fifteen turns on less. But it's, it's it's a set number of turns. This thing counts down with a slight with a slight randomness at the end to how many turns you might have left. And unless play, you know, characters are starting to be burned, it's as I said, it feels a little bit frustrating because you don't seem to be making the progress. However, a two-player game we played in fifteen minutes. Ah, oh, right, okay, oh, wow, okay. Because that was like it just happened. I just won, and it was like, oh, even I didn't realise I won. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I won. Ah, fallout yeah. syndrome. Yes, I won. Oh. Does it feel like it gets a bit frustrating and tedious towards the end? You're just kind of doing it and going through the motions? This is the problem with it. I think it's a good game, but it's a, it feels frustrating and tedious all the way through, oh, never well, mind okay. at the end. Yeah. It's, it's weird, it's enjoyable, and it's got this really cool concept, but it's frustrating. I can't quite decide whether I enjoy being frustrated by the game or not. And there were points mm. about from about a third of the way through the game that we were playing where I was excited because I'd managed to frustrate other people 
and then really pissed off because it's like I just there's never no way I'm ever actually going to get this briefcase close enough to 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 push it over the line. There's no like it's not like I can line up a couple of agents carefully because everyone else is maneuvering the same agents. So they're also trying to do the exact same thing. And everyone else has got their beady little eyes looking around at what John's up to. Like, there's no <laughs> way to uh oh yeah, no, there's no reason at all why this agent is now over here and then that one's over there. Because everyone's like, right, well if he does that one and that one's got that special move, that means that, that one over there can do that thing. Yeah. So there's no aven- avenues for subterfuge. You can't play like a sleeper agent or move another agent somewhere else. Okay. We can move. You can move another agent somewhere else, but then everyone's going. Well, why have they moved? You know. Yeah. Why has Steve moved Beacon over to the f- Paris? But you What's do you think about? And everyone's doing at the it- cost of actually doing what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You th- you think let's say fifteen turns is what it's you know fit twenty to fifteen turns is kind of what you're going to get in a game, and some of those turns are going to have to be putting money onto your board. Yeah. So you can't. You haven't got time to line up too many things. As, as John said, you could line up. You could get. You could get beacon right in the right place, and and then roulette's right in the right place, and then someone else uses moves roulette, and it's like, well, if you've got enough crowns on them, if you've got enough of these guineas, sorry, yeah, you can stop them. You can pause them from doing it, but then they know you've got lots of guineas on that character. So are you planning something here, Mister Tudor? Okay. So, as I said, it's frustrating, but I think frustration is almost what it's designed to be doing. It's designed mm. to be making you frustrated with it. Mm. And it's when somebody does manage to get all those things in a line that someone wins. I would definitely play it a few more times to just to kind of establish, is it genuinely just going to be frustrating every time? Or is it that kind of ingenious frustrating where it's like, I feel like I'm so close to having this now. Mm. <laughs> is it the sort of game that you you essentially spend three quarters of the game building up to a finale no no because, because you can't as i said you can't build things up because uh, yeah. people can move the put your pieces. well you haven't unless got any pieces to move a genius unless you're a genius <laughs> yes so, i should definitely play it then <laughs> why <laughs> <laughs> all right so yeah so that's Conspiracy of the Solomon Gambit from Restoration Games. Uh, I believe it's at for sale now. It's currently available. I have a funny feeling we need to play it a bit more. Yep. I'm up for that. So. Right, we have some questions from the mailbag, which I think we'll quickly do to top off the episode. So Luke O'Rafferty asks, Over the last few years, he's noticed something in the movie world where he's seen an emerging phenomenon <laughs> of hugely <laughs> successful <laughs> films <laughs> getting no, a no, backlash. No, no. A vocal number of people. He says he gives example of La La Land, which he says was a fantastic film, but it seemed to be the cool thing to slag it off. Do you think this is creeping into the board game world? Certainly not from the Polyhedron Collider crew. We are professional and objective. No, our slagging is entirely justified. <laughs> So he had to give us a specific and relevant to this episode example where he says he began to notice it with Wingspan, but he's definitely seeing it again with Tapestry, which is coming into a lot of significant uh, people cutting it down as quickly as possible, saying things like, I'll care when Jamie has a game in the top 100, which is like I thought all James games were in the top 100, but never mind. Have you seen this happening? And do you Um, notice any specific games or publishers? I know some specific reviewers. Why are you some of them are right miserable bastards. <laughs> <laughs> I freely admit I'm a miserable bastard that's easy to, uh, that's difficult to please, but you know, that just means people have to try hard <laughs> and make good shit instead of wank. But I mean, in terms of slagging people <laughs> off for the sake of it, I don't know. I think you could probably say the same thing in any industry that once somebody gets so successful that they're in the limelight a lot more, they're going to attract positive and negative press, possibly in equal amounts. I mean, look at Eric Lang. Mm. You know, he's he's a huge designer. Um, reputationally, yeah. obviously, he's, you know, quite an average-sized guy. But, um, you know, he's joined Kumon or Simon <laughs> or whatever the hell they're called these days. And, mm. you know, he's made quite a few games in the last couple of years. And I must admit, I'm not an Eric Lang fan. I don't like his games. I've played Blood Rage, and it was fun, mm. but I wouldn't buy it. I haven't played Rising Sun, yeah. which obviously I need to do, but I've played XCOM, which he designed, which yes, you I wasn't a massive fan of. 
But I mean, am I going to slag the games off because it's Eric Lang? No, I'm going to slag them off because there are elements of it that are dog shit. That's why. You've you've been dismissive of Simon in the past for a similar reason, though, haven't you? I have, actually. Now, it's not really because their games are bad. I think it's just more the fact that they feel very much like there's a bunch of miniatures with the games tacked on, and their business practice could be considered a little exploitative. I've seen this in certain forums, and it tends to be the same names cropping up over again, making this kind of signal to me. Uh, I won't name any names in this podcast, um, <laughs> but I almost feel like... Have you seen the little um, little cartoon of someone else holding someone's lips and going, shh, let people enjoy yes, things? Yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> I feel like just posting this whenever these people uh, come up yeah. now. I, th- I think that's fair, as I say, because I, I freely admit that Eric Lang's stuff and Simon's stuff isn't necessarily for me, but I'm not going to just sit down and go, mm. their stuff is all shit because it's Simon or Eric Lang. I just won't buy mm. their stuff. And that's it, you know, I'll vote yeah. my wallet and walk away. I think exactly. the important thing is, is that when you're listening to all this noise that you're hearing across social media, is listen to a voice that you actually care about, and one that mm. resonates with you. For example, there's the four of us, and we have quite different opinions on some games, but we kind of gravitate to roughly the same things. And if you agree with our opinions of the games that you've also played, chances are we're going to have similar tastes. In which case... Don't give a shit about anybody else. Just listen to us. <laughs> <laughs> or at least one of us. Me. One of us probably likes most games. Ryan Nethercutt asks, uh, I'd love to hear more John's thoughts on the Tesla Model 3 he's just received. Well, oh, yeah, would you guys make it a three for three? I'd like to say, Ryan, we are fed up of hearing about John's Tesla Model 3 <laughs> because it appears on his Facebook feed every half an hour i think i mean he put a picture on it today of him charging it like as if that was some kind of special event it's quite special (laughs) oh i got to hear about more of that in detail when he took me out in it actually apparently he has a bunch of energy points that he has to spend on like super fast charging points so he drove all the way up the motorway just to use a (laughs) charging point (laughs) it was on my way actually (laughs) but but when tesla says here's uh, 5,000 free supercharger miles, by the way, you've only got six months to use them. It does seem like stupid that you wouldn't then go and, well, go on a lot of road trips, frankly. <laughs> like free fuel. If someone said you can have free petrol for the next six months, uh, wouldn't you use it? Yes, and enter yeah. environment be damned. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That power's got to come from somewhere. But uh, I have been out in it. So as a relatively independent third party, I can say it is very nice. The acceleration on it is almost savage. Hmm. It's like a roller coaster. <laughs> it really except, is. Except you get to press you get to decide when it goes off and when it's when it slows down again. Very, very fun. However, I still think John uh, messed up and didn't buy the sports package because four point three seconds to sixty instead of three point two is frankly pedestrian. You know what? Think about all of the things you could be doing with your life in that saved time. I have to say, it is—it's a great car to drive. Um, it's ridiculously fast. I'm really glad that I didn't go for the performance model because, quite frankly, that one goes from naught to scary in less time than it takes to say naught to scary. <laughs> the less time it takes for poo to come out. <laughs> uh, the only thing I would say that I'd criticise about it is the wipers. Seems, really? seems, it sounds ridiculous, but you'd think it is like, ridiculous, John. With a with a high tech car, that they'd get windscreen wipers that trigger themselves. <laughs> but for some reason, uh, you have to turn them on yourself. <gasps> Basically, God forbid. yeah. Oof. Oh, this is so, ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Come on, John, my car's got auto windscreen wipers. Amanda's mini's so got mine. auto windscreen I know. wipers. Mine the even, Jack, I... even changed the uh, the duty cycle on mine. It's brilliant. You can do that manually. Years old. You could do that manually. Change the duty cycle on them. It's just the automatic pickup doesn't work. Apparently, Tesla have come up with something called Deep Rain, which uses all the cameras on the car uh, and some clever neural networks to pick up. What a very cheap and simple sensor could have done. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Why make something simple when you can spend a million dollars making it more expensive? 
and more complicated and more likely to go wrong. Yeah, why the hell not? So the your American car way. uses a camera to detect when it's raining. Well, it's got lots of cameras on it anyway. So I think right. Tesla's thinking is that we've got all these other sensors that we've got on the machine it anyway. It you. It is watching <laughs> you. So why, so why complicate things with extra sensors that are going to cost more money when we can just do it in software? And as a software engineer, I applaud that approach. <laughs> of course you would. Now, as, as, a, as a driver in England. Yeah, that's true. As a man who <laughs> frequents drinking establishments, the one thing I note about John's car is his dashboard is this lovely sort of wooden um, affair that goes the full width of the car, because essentially his entire dashboard is this little iPad thing in the middle. And so there's, this lo- there's lots of space for dashboard, and they've put this lovely walnut wooden effect across the thing. But instead of most dashboards being vertical... His dashboard is horizontal, which is where this wood thing is. And honestly, it looks like a bar. So I think you should get a hand (laughs) pull and a keg in the passenger seat footwell and have a pint for the the passenger. You pull your own beer. Well, I think you could do one better than that. Why have it in the passenger seat? Why not put it in the front? That seems like a perfectly usable space that is approximately one keg size. Perfect. (laughs) You should do that. But then John's going to be annoyed that he's going to have to pump the beer himself. Surely the Tesla should do it for him. That's a fair That's a point. point. Mm. <laughs> Maybe you could plug it into the windscreen wiping system. <laughs> Spray beer on the windscreen. That won't go down well. No, just repurpose it because it doesn't do anything anyway <laughs> to clear the windows, so you might as well get some benefit out of it. <laughs> Have all those cameras detect when you're thirsty and pour you a beer. Why not? Yeah, when you get... <laughs> Is John awake? <laughs> Have a beer, John. <laughs> Yeah, it just picks up whether I'm still applying pressure on the steering wheel while it's automatically driving me to the place I need to get to. It's true. Yeah. Actually, you'll find <laughs> the sorry, more Johnny. beer you drink, the more it decides to take over the driving. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. So all in all, it's a fantastic car. Lovely to drive. Really, really, it feels like a piece of the future. If you've got some money to spare, I would highly recommend indulging yourself. And what have you done with it, John? Mean, um, haven't you given it a name? You've got to give him a name. You They've don't got name names. a car. Look, okay, so when it turns up, it just says John's Tesla. And what's wrong with that? In the app and on the car, well, it just seems a bit like I don't know. It just seems a bit lame. As opposed to the name you've actually given it, which is entirely fantastic. <laughs> I thought the Scarlet Streak sounded pretty cool. Yeah. Other than it makes you sound like you've got dysentery. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got a scarlet streak, that's, that's a lot worse than dysentery, mate. That's a real problem. <laughs> Andy, have you named your car? I have not. No. Steve? Steve. Yeah. Ha. <laughs> Good. Ooh, what's what your, is what's it called, cool, Steve? The car. Mine's the executor. The executor. <sighs> <laughs> you see, I'm not the only one. It, it's because well, it's the it's the executive model car that I've got, mm. and it's also the name of Darth Vader's superstar destroyer. Um, <laughs> 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 At least the man has a reason. <laughs> There's a story behind it. John's car is red. Mine. He's named it Scarlet Streak. Uh, it's red, and the only thing you see of it is this blur. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I think I think that's enough for one night. Oh, right, very. We got a couple more questions we can quickly burn through. Um, Dave Clark, uh, who is not the David Clark from Sinister Fish Games, but Dave from Bavaria, asks uh, which board game has the best replay value in your opinion? Oh God. Um, <laughs> well. I was thinking about this, Steve, when you posted your top nine games, Steve. You had Pandemic in yours. Mm. See, uh, I, I would have Pandemic yeah. on mine easily any day of the week. Mm. That's got fantastic replay value for me. I agree with that, yeah. I would still happily play Pandemic tonight. Game of Trains, that's got to be up there. I was considering Game of Trains myself, actually. That is, that is always good. I also like High Society. That is a wonderful game. Just lightweight. It's bizarre, actually, because the games we mentioned are not the games which, when people say, oh, it's got loads of replayability because it's got 20,000 character options and 20,000 enemy options, they're all just games which, because of the randomness of the deck, yeah. have you to think about the puzzle differently every time. Mm. I have to say, I will also throw in too many bones into this. Yeah. 
Sod which off. does have the 20,000 character It really options. does. But I You're won't. very cruel, by the way, Andy. Oh, like, Just yes. as I was packing up to go home, he's like, by the way, here's too many bones. You can take the lid off and you can look at the components, John. <laughs> Mother... <laughs> I'm like, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna open this because he's like, go on, open it. I'm like, fine, I'll open it. I'm like, oh, oh, it's all pretty, and now I want to play this, but I've got to go because I'm supposed to be meeting Gav. <laughs> <laughs> Gav can wait. No, he can't. Oh, he can. He wouldn't mind if I'm two hours late. <laughs> no, he will. Damn. <laughs> And on that crushing disappointment for Mr. Cage, I think Billy needs to call it a day. For... So, thank you very much for listening. We have been Polyhedron Collider. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, please leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or your podcast platform of choice. Uh, we are available on Twitter. Uh, I'm, well, collectively we're at Polyhedron C, but it's me that run that, runs that account. And I am personally at, well, half of my denger. I am at Sonic H with a zero. I'm at John underscore Cage. And I'm at Rory J. Summers. You can also find us at uh, on Facebook. And we also have a Board Game Geek Guild, number 2726. If you like a bit of D&D, you can join us every Thursday on twitch.tv forward slash polyhedron collider for some D&D sessions, which are getting increasingly dodgy. Champion to Chance, Master of Fate, both looking like they're in a spot of bother. Every week, guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all right. The last session of the Masters of Fate, we managed to run an ISO 9001 audit. It got very exciting <laughs> when when the clerk couldn't find the right paperwork. Ooh, it almost got as exciting as the archers. <laughs> well... The, uh, the Champions of Chance are currently trying to play Dam Busters fairly unsuccessfully. I heard so you tried to break a dam with a really pitifully weak spell, John. Uh, there were uh, inconclusive attempts to... I mean, they're, not, it's, they're not done yet. Let's, no. let's put it that way. It's still a work in progress. The Champions Chance spent hours literally doing nothing. <laughs> Achieving nothing. They Achieving, were doing quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Bickering, yeah. Anyway, so if you don't have enough of that every Thursday night, uh, any day now, honest, uh, I will finish <laughs> uploading <laughs> the sessions that you've probably missed to youtube.com forward slash user forward slash polyhedron collider. I'll tell you what, I will make a promise to you guys. Obviously, by the time this airs, uh, I will have uploaded at least one more episode. I'm going to kick one off tonight because I've actually transcoded most of them. I just haven't started uploading them, so I'm going to start that backlog going tonight. Is, I swear. Is that the same? Is this the same kind of promise you made Kaz three years ago when you were going to make that mirror? <laughs> no, this one's much more achievable. <laughs> <laughs> I actually believe I'm going to do this one. And if you're hungry for more news or Kickstarter highlights or to read some of the reviews of the games that we've been playing, you can head over to polyhedroncollider.com and it's all there. We should be back in a couple of weeks, but for now, happy gaming and dati bye. Ta-ra. Catch you later. Bye-bye.